Good morning, church. I heard the, I read this meme this week, but I'll share it um, a little bit later on in my message. But look, just two things I want to do first, if you would allow me a little bit of liberty. <clears throat> I just want to honour two people in the room today. First of all, being my beautiful mother, Val. For those of you who don't know in the front row, this is my mother. Um, I'm absolutely convinced of, of one thing, that I would not be in the house of God, much less serving him without the prayers of a faithful woman who, when I was walking my own way, doing my own thing, um, she prayed and she prayed and she prayed until at the age of 20 I encountered Jesus for myself. And so I honour her um, this morning just for her faithful prayers. The second person I want to honour in the room this morning is my beautiful firstborn, the one who was the first to call me mum and to um, open up this incredible journey of motherhood. So I bless you this morning, Caleb. How many firstborns in the room this morning? Loud and proud, how many firstborns? Beautiful. You carry a grace, amen, like no others, because the parents have got the big L plates when we take you home and we have no idea what we're doing. And all the parents went, amen. How many baby borns in the room this morning? Come on, loud and proud, babies. Who are the baby borns? We also, I too was a baby born, one of three. We carry an incredible grace upon us also because how many of you know that in your family it took however many attempts until you came along to bring perfection. And I feel the weight of that myself. I know how that is. So to all the baby borns, woohoo! <laughs> you know, as Alan said, we've been... Um, can I just get that verse up, that Romans verse? We've been listening to um, Alan preach around current culture and as he very delicately put it, I just... I'd like to say more that I just shared my perspective, but Alan would say that I pushed back and I was uncomfortable, to be honest, to share with you this morning because I'm so, I'm so enjoying the church at the moment and hearing the word of God preached so freely around current culture and pushing against what we're having kind of pushed at us. So I was hesitant until, you know, I began to um, sit with it and pray about it and I felt like God spoke to me that, you know, one of the biggest purposes or reasons, if you like, that um, current culture exists is because it is coming against the very divine design that God orchestrated when he created family. And so probably for the first time I could see, you know what, maybe we could give this a shot. And all I want to do this morning is share my perspective. I have three points that I want to share with you. Three points that I feel like um, puts us in or positions us to come against culture when, it, when it's coming against that beautiful design of family. And by that I mean man, woman, child. Amen? Or man, woman, whatever God's called you. But don't leave here without having it very clear that I'm making reference to man, woman. Do we love all of mankind? Yes, we do. But God has a beautiful design and it was always meant to be man, woman. Now, George, where are you, George? Are you here? Where's George? Stand up, George. George, I just want you to know that I have the love of God for you and you are a groover, you're a muso. You make that whole look look awesome. Amen? But I just want to share a story. So I say that that's my disclosure. So you just know that my heart is for you, I love you, and you look cool. However, some years back, my firstborn approached his father and I and he wanted to get an earring. George, yours looks amazing. So you have to get context. Caleb would have been about seven-ish. And he wanted to get an earring. And his father and I were mortified because it just was going to look really bad. So you have to have, have an understanding. Not, he didn't look cool like George with his earring. He had the first uh, four of his uh, top teeth were missing. He had decided that he was going to turn his hair... <laughs> I should have brought a photo, funniest thing. He had his hair designed in a mohawk and then he came out and he wanted to have this earring in his ear. And I thought, like, seriously, Caleb, do you know about bullying yet? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's not looking good. And a wise friend said to me this advice that I've carried through, I hope, my mothering. And she said this, Jackie, say yes 
as often as you can on the proviso that it doesn't morally or biblically break any rules. And I mean, I looked for that earring. I've looked for the mohawk because it was wrong on every level. But you know what we did? Yes, Caleb, you can do that. And we prayed like, God, give him revelation of just how stupid he's going to look. But outwardly, we said, yes, Caleb, go for it. And so Caleb went and got his earring. And I'm pleased to say that he's not a groover musician. Today, he's an accountant. just doesn't work. So he no longer has the earring. Power of prayer. But the key was, say yes as often as you can. Because when you've got to bring a no, it, means it has carries weight. It means something. So what that did for Alan and I <clears throat> is it caused us to take a step back I guess as parents, and look at what, were, what was going to be our non-movables. What were the things that no matter what the kids came home to do, no matter how much they pushed back, no matter what friends and, and other families were doing, what were Alan and my non-movables, the things that we would not budge on? Well, for modern parents, you'd understand me when I say social media was a big one. Like how many of you know they're just pushing from primary school age these days to get social media because that's where it's all at. For Alan and I, we came to an agreement that it was just a non-negotiable. Until the kids were at least 16, we said no. Were they keen about it? No. Did they push back? Yes. Did they try to get it without us knowing? Yes. <laughs> As a parent, you would all know... It's hard. It's relentless. It is constant. That you get over one mountain, there's another one there that there's pushing. Because culture is such that it's coming aggressively against us. What are your non-negotiables? No matter how hard it is, I've learned that it's always worth it. Always worth maintaining position. Because it brings a stability in the home. Even if there's unrest, even if there's pushback, it brings about a stability. Maybe you're someone here today and you have no children. Maybe that's a dream, maybe it's not. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus either way. But for us, we had two people. When I was putting this together, Alan and I were just remembering two people and the kids would remember these guys really well when they were young. Neither of them were married. Neither of them had children. Uh, one of them was a school teacher as well, but he was one of our dearest friends and still remains that way, has gone on now to be married and have two of his own little girls. And another one is also married now and she's got her own family. But these two were single um, people who hung around our family a lot. Um, I used to always say they were like their surrogate aunt and uncle in Ross and Rachel. And you know what I loved about them is despite them not having children, despite them not being married, and I want to say that to those of you who are in the room this morning who do not have children, you hold such a valuable place in, in the families that you hang about with. These guys were as a very um, important part of our village. You know, we've all heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a family. Well, these two were just so important to us and to our kids. You know, when we were off doing things um, in ministry, they'd be off hanging out with the kids, taking them down to the beach to play footy. But you know the thing I love about them the most is whether they agreed with them or not, whether they even understood them or not, they upheld our values to our kids. They never um, spoke ill about us to our kids behind our back. They were for us, to our children. They honoured us in front of our children. And so if you're around the room this morning and you don't have children, my goodness, our families need you. You have such an important part to play. You're an important um, um, ingredient in the family. Pushing against current culture. What we need to remember is we fight not against flesh and blood. Amen? Children are not the enemy. And I mean, I've had days where I've thought, I don't know. But children are not the enemy, friends. They're out there, the, the powers and the principalities, that's what we fight against. Culture is telling us how a family should be. I've got three points that I want to share with you if I can. My first point is stay in the ring. What does that mean? How, you know, raising a family is a battle. We're in a ring and, and it, is a, it is actually a fight against current culture. One of the first things or first times that I thought of when I was putting this together is when my daughter turned seven and she'd kind of moved out of that age of um, little girl clothes, you know, you know, the little frilly, sparkly and we started to look in shops for that age between seven and 14. And, you know, we only had one girl and so it was all new to me. I was used to shopping with the boys and so this was a whole new experience to me. 
And I was astounded at first at how culture, at, at the wee age of seven, was telling us what our little girls should look like. If I can say this, and if you can hear my heart, men, in the room, this is not a time for you to sit on the sideline and let your wife sort it out. It's not a time for you to take a step back and allow your wife to be the voice to your children. We need our fathers to step in the ring and fight. And I know when I was doing a little bit of wrestling through those days of what was going to be appropriate to wear and what was not going to be appropriate to wear, I might have been the voice to our daughter, but her father was praying for me. Her father was praying for her. Her father and I were talking a lot. Whenever I spoke to her, it was always on behalf of us. So fathers, do, do not abort the mission. Do not step out of the ring and leave your wife hanging in there. You get in the ring and you do battle with her. We had a rule when the boys started to get a little bit older and they started to explore um, girls. Um, it was a non-negotiable. Girls don't sleep over at our house. It's just full stop and, and there's no discussion around that. Do girls enter your bedroom? It's not happening on our watch. Does it sound old-fashioned and prudish? Truth is, I don't care. Because we don't want to put um, temptation in the front of our kids and then say, don't do and be surprised when they do. Amen? So whether there's resistance, whether there's pushback, it's full stop. They don't go in your room and we don't do sleepovers. Parties and drinking. You know, one thing I know when our kids got to around the age of years 9 and 10, there's a real culture, amen, of parties and um, it's the whole pressure of did, did your child get an invite, did your child not get an invite, how does that make them feel? And there's a whole gamut of um, issues that are tackled within the family unit when that happens. And I, you know, I've watched some of my kids be the only one that was not invited, How's that feel as a parent? It's really hard. You know, when your flesh wants to get in that kid's business and slap them around, to be honest, for being so nasty and exclusive. But in the other hand, praise God. Praise God. Your prayers are working. Who out of the older generation has not done something stupid? None of you? You holy bunch of people. Who out of the older generation has not done something stupid in your younger years? Anyone? I know you have, Paul. Anyone? Oh, yeah, I know you have. Yeah? We had a situation some years ago where Alan and I um, had gone away to a, a church conference and it was three days long. And, on the, and um, one of our boys was around 17, so last year of high school. And so for some of them, um, they're all turning 18 and so there's that tension, you know, where they're not quite out in the world, but they're turning 18, and so all those um, temptations are screaming out for them. And we'd been away, and we, we left this one instruction <clears throat> to this particular child, and we said, you can have four people who wanted to watch the State of Origin, four people, name them, which he did. And we said, you can have four people come and watch um, the State of Origin, and then they need to go home straight away. And so off we went to our conference, Happy days. On the last night of the conference, we'd been to worship. We had a lovely time. Had a lovely time. Alan had gone and bought a bottle of wine and he poured me a glass of wine and I thought, well, this is lovely. Just Huey and Dewey and, you know, we're going to have a little bottle of wine. We're going to have a little romantic night. And he said to me, we just, I just need to have a chat to you before we go home. Now, we have this rule in our house, and I don't know what you're like, and, you know, each of us have our own personality, but we have this unspoken rule in our family that if what you're about to tell mum may provoke a reaction, go and tell dad first and let dad be the one to break the news to mum. So, Kirchie pours me this bottle, of, little glass of, a bottle of wine. I should have had a bottle of wine, but it was a glass of wine. And he says, I just need to tell you that when we go home tomorrow... Um, this ch child, A, has had a little situation. And the four people that he had invited over to watch the State of Origin, one of them had really lovingly put it up on Facebook. And so you know those families where you watch on a current affair and the house is trashed and they go home and that was my life. We, I, I sat there listening to Alan and I could feel the rage. I'm telling you, come from the depths of my feet working up in, it, in my body. It was one of those things that you are better off 
to let dad tell mum because mum is going to have feelings about that. And so when I walked into the house the next day and the child number A says, mum, I promise we've cleaned it up. And I'm looking around as I literally peel my feet off the sticky floor from the residue of the night before when I saw screen doors pulled off its hinges. Amen. I was that a current affair family. And I thought, just breathe. What would Jesus do? (laughs) I actually didn't think that at all. I was like, Jesus, for this kid's life, you better do something really quick. So here's what I said to him. I want names. I want addresses. And then we're dad and I going to deal with it. But here's how it's going to roll. We're not going to just forget that this happened. And look, there was grace. To be fair, there was grace. He'd put, he had not been part of putting it on social media. But this is culture, people. This is what we're raising our kids around. People do not have respect for others and their belongings. Let me tell you. So, you know, what was interesting is that is within a couple of days, we had two boys turn up at our door because we got names and we got addresses. But the, this particular kid's really good friends came around in tears, sat Kirchie down, apologised, asked for forgiveness and made it right. And my lesson in that that I took away is, you know, we, it's not just about our kids. We have an obligation. These two kids have been around our family for years. They've grown up with our kids. They've been in our home. They've been around our home. They know what our beliefs are. They know what our values are. And when they came to us, you know, it was so beautiful because they had observed our values. And while they may not share our values, there was respect for our values enough to come and make it right. And so it is so important for us as families to push back against culture. Don't assume that people are not watching, that your kids' friends are watching. You know, rebellion is a very real thing that we tackle in our families, in our communities, in every layer of society. But you know what? We're called not to compromise. We're called not to give in to it because you feel it's not working or you're not getting the results that you think or perhaps your families are not living the way that you'd hoped and prayed they would, you know what, don't give up, don't despair. My mother continued to pray, continued to pray, even when in the natural it didn't look like it was working. Parenting is a long journey. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. I don't want to offend anyone this morning, but here's what I just believe. Prioritise church. I'm saddened when I see so many families who do not prioritise church, that it's not a a non-negotiable for you. I guess reasons being that that's where relationships are formed, with people of like mind. That's where you glean your support from. Corporate worship, we model this to our kids that this is important. Hearing the teaching of the word of God, you know, there will be a day where they won't be allowed to hear it in schools and other areas. It's important to establish a lifestyle. Prioritise church. Many a day on a Sunday when our kids were little, I mean, it would just be a job. And I I just have such respect for you young families up the back. It's a job to get out the door on time. I know it is. And I know every Sunday morning, it it all breaks out. The kid, everything that could does. Amen? I I completely remember those days. But I I promise you, as you sow into those kids, you will reap a harvest for that. Don't give up. Prioritise church. If we don't model these things to our kids... How is it that we can be surprised then when they get to the age of 14, 15 and they don't want to come to church anymore? That, that, you know, Alan has often made a reference, what will church look like for the little ones down there if we compromise on culture now? It's the same prioritising church. There'll be a day where it just won't be normal for kids to come to church. You know, Alan often says up the front here, but even in our home he often says, if we allow ourselves to get off course by one degree... What, what that can look like to our faith. Well, I guess I want to throw it out this morning. What can that look like to our families if we get, of course, one degree and we stop prioritising these things? What it means to serve in the house of God? What does it look like to give? I mean, Owe has often said to us with his kids who are our age, amen, yeah, that he would always pull money out of his wallet. Remember the day when we had cash? 
And he, but he would do that by way of modelling to his children how important it was to give into the house of God. Prioritise church. You know, our kids might not have liked it when they were young, but it wasn't an option. It was not a conversation. You, you, we are all going to church as a family. The battle that we're in is our culture versus our conviction. So stay in the ring. Families, parents, stay in the ring. Mothers, stay in the ring. Fathers, stay in the ring. Even when there's pushback, and there will be. If you haven't had it yet, it's coming. Stay in the ring. You know, um, some years ago, um, Jordan, our youngest boy, was at school. And... um, he had done an, he had um, bullied uh, a child and um, we got, you know, I mean, I had a well-worn track into the principal's office, don't worry. I mean, I work at a school now and it's actually really lovely to not be that parent. I look at those dear ones coming in and think, I hear you, I've been there. I have a well-worn track to the principal's office. So on the one in many occasions that we got called into the office of the principal, Um, Jordan had had this little situation with one of the kids at school and the school policy was that bullying obviously was a no-no and there were certain levels and some of it required suspension and some of it was expulsion and then some of it was detention and so on. Anyway, we had this meeting and there was some more investigating to be done and so I get this call but Alan and I kind of could feel the gist of where it should be heading. And I got this call from the principal at the time and he said, Jackie, we've been talking about um, what Jordan did at the school and um, we really feel like we've got to be very mindful of his mental health and the welfare and so we really want to come around that. You know, I could feel myself getting cranky. And so, you know what, I thought, I'm just going to cut it off there if you don't mind. And I tried to be as loving as I possibly could. And I said, if you don't mind, I'm just going to stop you right there. Here's the deal. Your policy says bullying is not an option. Therefore, here's what's going to happen. His father and I have already signed him up to a caravan park in the local area. So he's not going home for three days, parents, sitting on the bed playing Xbox. He's going to go out and do hard labour. And so here's what's going to happen. You're going to suspend him. You're going to send him home to us. And he's going to do three days of hard work out in the yard at a caravan park. Because you know what? If they don't feel the weight of the consequence and they don't learn the lesson, bullying is unacceptable. And parents, you know what? Sometimes, sometimes you've just got to let your kids feel the weight of consequence that when they've done something wrong, they need to own it, wear it, and then walk out the consequence. Which leads me into my next point. We as parents are not called to be their best friend. We are living in a culture where children are protected from failure, they're protected from disappointment, they're sheltered from experiencing pain, sheltered from discomfort, sheltered from disappointment of any kind. We give ribbons out for everything. There's pressures on schools, there's pressures on unis, there's pressures on family to not let kids feel the weight of pain and discomfort today. You know what? It's good for them. It's actually good for them. It was good for Jordan to get out there and have to do some hard labour and be accountable for his poor choices. James 1 verse 2 to 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete, lacking nothing. That scripture suggests to me that without allowing our kids to experience these trials and these testings, we actually raise them to be incomplete and to lack. And so while we think we're doing a great thing, we're doing our kids a disservice. We are not raising them to be complete adults. They need to feel the weight of consequence. They need to know when they've made a poor decision. And I know it's hard. I I, I mean... As much as some days I, and you know what, I used to smack my kids. I'll tell you something that was a standard, and you might be alarmed to know, and online, I'm sorry. In my handbag was a staple, purse, wooden spoon. And you have no idea how many times I broke that wooden spoon on a Sunday morning, and I'm unapologetic about it. Because you know what? They need to feel the weight of consequence. That poor choices lead to trouble. Some of my greatest times of growth as a human, just as a, as a person, much less as a, as a Christian, have, been to- have come through times of great challenge, 
great pain and great discomfort. I know that it looks like I go to the gym regularly, but I don't. So I'm, I'm not speaking from experience, it's just of what I've heard. That when you go to the gym and you begin to build muscle, it hurts. That's why I don't go. I went and two days later, well, you can't walk. It's ridiculous. But it, but it does, it hurts, doesn't it? There's something about building muscle. We're, we're looking to raise children who have resilience. And you know what? It's going to hurt. Days two is going to be worse. But it, it's vital for them not to be lacking. We are currently experiencing a culture within modern parenting where we are trying to move all of the discomfort. And if I can just speak specifically to the young families, the ones that generally sit up the back, what a great job you are doing. And I I genuinely mean that because you are raising kids in unprecedented times. I'm sure my parents and their parents never thought that we would see a day where discipline was not allowed, where you actually couldn't... I'm not talking flog, all right? There's a very big difference between abuse and discipline, and let's be clear about that. But you are raising kids in a very, very difficult time where culture is telling you what you're allowed and not allowed to do. And the truth is we didn't have that. We, We definitely did not have that. And so I commend you and encourage you to keep running the course. Do it biblically. Get in there. God has got some radical tips on raising families so that your little ones will be complete. You're contending against technology. See, we didn't have that. It wasn't something that we had to battle with. But you, you in this current time are. And I encourage you, stick to the course. Find out what your non-negotiables are as parents. God believes in you and so does your faith community. We are cheering for you. We are championing you and we exhort you to keep going. Our, Our culture, our communities need that. However... Um, one thing I would encourage you, this is what I found as a mum, one, um, one of the most important things that I, that I had in my life was older people who could speak into my life as a mother. And I know Kirchie was the same, but that you could go to. Because it's difficult. When you're in it, it's really hard to have fresh eyes. When you're in it and you're emotionally drained and you just want to throw the towel in and give in and let them have every social media platform... Rally around you, people who are a little bit further along in the journey. You know, one of the saddest things that we don't see today in our culture is families no longer have the village around them. It's like they build a fence around their family. Our children aren't perfect, and especially, if you don't mind me saying, um, families in Christian community. We're not game to show that our families are not perfect, that we've got struggles within, that our kids are not doing life so well or our kids have got struggles. Let me tell you, as a family, that's when you need your village. That's when you need to be able to let it all hang out and have people pray and walk with you. Build your village and be intentional about doing that. Not someone who's just going to flatter you. Here's my little last one. Anyway, I know it. Here's my third and final point. And I want you to hear my heart when I share this with you. How many of you heard the passage, train them up in the ways of the Lord and he will not depart from them? I got to a stage in my parenting where I said to Al, the next Christian who says that to me, I'm actually going to slap them up the back of the head. And let me, let me give you context. I don't literally mean that. <laughs> I did have my day, actually. But let me tell you why. It's such a beautiful passage. And you know what? It does exactly what it should do. It should give you hope. But here's what I found. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. That's, that's what theologians call it. It's a wisdom literature. Amen? Just like you walk into a library and you see romance novels, you see fiction novels, you see history novels, you see war. They're all genres. And, and, it, and Proverbs is a wonderful genre. And it's probably one of my favourite books in the Bible. But what I notice is that scripture allows you as parents to become really complacent. Because we just assume if we read the Bible to them, if we pray for them, If we go to church, if we do all of those things, they'll be fine because they will not depart from it. Let me tell you, that's a myth. There are no guarantees. There are no guarantees that that will happen. 
It's good and it's right and it's a wisdom to do those things. Train them up. I exhort that and I'm 100% on board with it. But don't assume that that's your ticket. You know, the truth is we've got a battle for our kids. We've got a battle for the next generation. It's actually not about us. And in some ways it's not even about... I, I, I truly do sit and pray about my grandchildren. What will culture look like when my, when my children have their children? And so we literally have a responsibility to not just assume that it'll all work out, but to actually get in and pray. You know, I've had some of my strongest discussions regarding my children with my Heavenly Father alone. And it's never actually breached with my kids. I've never had those conversations with them. But I, I've had those conversations in prayer when I've gone into my own little room with my Heavenly Father and I've poured out my heart. I've told him how I feel or what, whatever's going on. But prayer, to me, prayer is the bottom line. Train them up in the ways of the Lord. Yes, you should do that. That's a very good idea. But don't stop there. You do battle in prayer. Parents, mothers, fathers, aunties, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, whatever you are in the room today, you do battle in prayer. That's the only guarantee. And there's a beautiful scripture. Can I have those scriptures up on the um, James and Peter? No. Is there Peter? So 1 John, yeah. 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God hears your prayers. Amen. 1 John. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. This is what you can take to the bank. Train them up in the ways of the Lord. It's wisdom. But this is what you can take to the bank. That if we ask anything according to his will, anything that is in alignment with the word of God, he hears you. He hears you and he begins to act. Isn't that beautiful? Your heavenly father hears you so long as it aligns itself with the word of God. You know what? Was I a good mother? Truth is, I don't know. Did I do the best that I could with the knowledge that I had at the time? Yes. I think you can do the right thing with the wrong motivation. But you can also mess it up with the right motivation and God can cover that. The truth is we're all a work in progress. I, as 28 years ago when I became a mum, oh dear Jesus, poor Caleb, I just, and I truly mean thank God for the grace of a firstborn because I'm a different person today than what I was 28 years ago. So throughout the years of my mothering, I've done the best that I could with the knowledge that I have. But here's my number one tip. Many a night, many a night, and my children would say yes to this. When they were tucked up in bed and the house fell quiet, that it allowed the voice, the beautiful voice of the Holy Spirit to say, you responded harshly to that, Jackie. You misread that situation, Jackie. He was not telling you the truth with that, Jackie, and so you've disciplined him, but it should have been him. And you've got a choice in that moment as a parent. Oh, they'll be right. They'll wake up tomorrow and we'll start all again. Or you can go into their room, wake them gently. I'm so sorry. I made a mistake. I spoke harshly. I didn't represent Jesus the best that I could to you right now. Because the thing is, I don't want them to go to bed with that in their heart where I've wounded them. You know, we have a responsibility to be a, the best representation of Jesus. We can be perfect? No. Because we're all works in progress. But it's so important for us to humble ourselves when we've muffed it. And if there's one thing that I had to do consistently throughout my kids and I still do to be honest have to, I still make mistakes I still read things wrong I still respond inappropriately but I felt it important that when my kids were little was to go in if they're asleep wake them up better that you humble themselves and be honest than let them sleep with unrest in their heart amen let's pray stay in the ring you know not called to be their best friend and prayer. Prayer is your only guarantee. Church, we have a culture is coming against the divine design of family. And we have a responsibility, whether we have children or not, to do warfare with that. That has a massive implication to the rest of our community. Amen.
Father, you are such a good God. Lord, your wisdom in all things is just so amazing. God, you lack nothing. And our heart, Father, as families, God, is to please you as we raise our little ones. Lord, for those in the room who um, have no children for whatever reason, God, I just pray that your grace would abound. Lord, that you would allow them to see their vital role in the puzzle. Father, to be part of a village, God, to be that voice, to be that safe place, to be that encouragement, God. For parents in the room today, God, I pray, especially those, Father, whose children have gone array. Lord, would you encourage their hearts this morning, Father? Would you speak to them, God, to keep running the race, to get in that room and to pray and to pray and to pray? Father, for those parents, Lord, whose kids are running wholeheartedly after Jesus, I just pray, Father, bless them and encourage them. And God, give them tools and, and, and ways, Father, to keep their kids on track. Father, protect those ones. Lord, I thank you for your beautiful design of family. Lord, I thank you that you're calling us as a community to rise up to rise up, God, and to be a voice, an advocate for your beautiful design. Lord, we thank you for the strength that's in family, spiritually and, and physically, God. Lord, help us where we're weak, help us where we're tired, help us, Father, where we lack wisdom. God, would you walk with us? through this journey of raising our families. Father, for every young person in this room, God, and those online, I thank you for every one of them, God. I thank you that they're born for such a time as this, God. Lord, that within them, Father, there is every good thing that they need in order to run their race. Lord, help us to draw it out. Help us to disciple it. Help us to nurture it, God, and to see them fulfill all the plans and purposes that you have for them. Father, we bless you this morning. We love you. We thank you for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.